All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Discovering Multifamily. I'm your host, Anthony Scandariato, and today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Glenn Sutherland. And Glenn Sutherland is a real estate investor, uh, actually from um, Canada, uh, Cambridge, uh, Ontario. Uh, he lives there you know, with his wife and two children, and uh, he started his investment journey with buy and hold uh, uh, rental real estate properties you know, locally. And, um, you know, he's researched a lot and what he was able to find from his research, some more favorable laws, um, you know, lower property taxes and um, lower cost of of, um, entry, which is south of the border. So he's in Canada and and he actually runs a a podcast, um, which is focused on um, Canadian investing in the United States. So... Uh, we want to talk about his show and we want to learn uh, his reasons more in depth for um, investing essentially out of his, his country into the United States, which is where I'm based. So, uh, Glenn, thank you for having, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, Anthony. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, sure. Yeah, so my, my quick story is I, I have, well, I used to have a lot of rental properties in Canada also, and I got used to one of my great tenants moved a few hours away. And I kept them as a, I went and bought properties over there to keep them because they were that good of a tenant. Like they improved the property on their own. Um, so once I got used to a couple hours, I was like, well, we're talking, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago. And back then podcasts were mostly all United States. Like they're right now, there's tons of them in Canada, but back then it was all, well, you know, the big names, those are the ones that were still there back then. And, uh, and that's what I learned a lot from, right? And then I got comfortable with the United States and I was like, well, well, let's do some research in this. And I'm like, a lot of times the down payment that I was making on properties in Canada could be like the purchase price in the United States. If you're sure. going to compare the market I'm in now, it would be similar to like a New York City or uh, California where the purchase prices are like, you know, half a million dollars or more, right? It's, it, 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 they don't cash flow as well at those sort of price points. So that's, a, that's one of the things that got us started us started me on the journey down there. Um, and I made the mistakes that most people make. I tried to do it all on my own off the start, which is the worst thing to do. Um, so I did lots of growing pains. Uh, I've worked out a lot of kinks. Uh, we're operating in four markets now in the United States. And if I had to do it all again, I would have partnered with somebody. I would have, uh, you know, they always say it's better to have like, what do you to say? Piece of the watermelon than the, the full grape or whatever. I don't know how that goes, but anyway, it would, I could have done, I could have grown faster off the start and picked up things a lot faster than learning it on my own. Um, that's one of the reasons I do the podcast is to try and save people a lot of these growing pains uh, for doing distance investing. Cause there's a lot of mistakes you can make uh, going down and, <laughs> go, and being that far away from your properties and being that far away from your property management and your construction team and everything else. Can you talk about some of the similarities though, between Canadian investing and us? Well, really they're in the whole scope of things. They are, it's very similar, right? Um, There is some corporate structure that's different. um, But the meat and potatoes of it, like, you know, it is an apartment building or it is a house or it is a fourplex. It is still a building. You're still renting it. Um, it, it, it there isn't that many different or that many similar, <laughs> sorry, there isn't that many differences uh, to the thing. There are differences though. Um, uh, lending uh, is more expensive in the States. Um, the, like the house I'm living is sitting and doing this podcast and right now I'm paying under 2% as a mortgage rate, right? Like the rates are really low, right? In Canada. Um, whereas in the States, the property taxes are way lower. Uh, like this property, I think is like five or $6,000 a year in property taxes. Whereas my, if I got tough compared to a single family in Alabama, it's like six or $700 a year or in Indianapolis, it would be like $1,200 a year for a similar sort of property. Right. Um, so it's the property taxes are far lower. Um, the cost to entry is so much lower because you're buying uh, much, well, depending where you're investing, right? Uh, I'm a Midwest investor. So I'm uh, primarily started in Alabama. Uh, I moved my operation to Missouri and Indianapolis, uh, sorry, Kansas City, Missouri. 
and I was in Northern Alabama in Huntsville. And now I'm uh, mostly operating in Dayton, Ohio and the area around it, some of the smaller towns and stuff. And usually about, it switches about once a year, I switch markets. And it's not because I, it's the one year mark, but it, a lot of the times something's happened to that market. I usually like something in the market and it's boosted the market. And then I have a hard time paying like way more for properties a year later because something's happened. Like in Huntsville, Alabama, all the stuff came in there. They, the Toyota, the Mazda, Blue Origin, uh, and it boosted the properties. They expanded the FBI headquarters, uh, the, the Navy base, or not Navy, our Army base there. Everything grew in uh, a couple of years ago and it made the properties much less affordable. So it caused me to switch markets. But anyway, anyway, <laughs> a, 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 a total slant. Um, the other, uh, one of the other differences is landlord laws. Um, there's just so many more markets in the United States. There are good markets for landlord laws in Canada. Um, I don't live in one. Um, I live in a very tenant friendly province. So that's one of the things I've sort of going to the States. Why not pick a place that's, you know, what's my biggest pains right now uh, investing here? And if I'm going to go a distance, go and try and pick as many of the good things that you can. And there's lots of good markets in the United States, probably about half of them uh, have good landlord laws. Um, and so that's basically where I, what, what I was looking for as well is to try not to be going through these long drawn out three, four month, five month evictions here in Ontario and get into uh, something where I can do this in about a month is what I was hoping for. Um, and what, if I go back to the pricing, uh, the difference for uh, rent to value ratios. So if you're buying like cheap houses, like I don't know, 50,000, even a hundred thousand dollar houses, you can easily rent them for the 1% rule. I always say that the 1% rule is kind of pitched by these podcast people who are, uh, you know, that's what they can deliver as a turnkey operation. Um, I usually am going much higher than that, but sometimes I'm going into sea level neighborhoods uh, to get the higher returns. But um, as, as you get into cheaper properties, you can get the rent to value pushed. And if you get into multifamily, you can get it pushed even more. Um, so at that same, uh, I don't know, $100,000 house, you could rent it for, I don't know, $1,200 or so. But if you go and get a $1,000 duplex, you could rent it for like $750 and $750. And if you get like a $100,000 fourplex, uh, you know, it just keeps phenomenally growing. So you can get better returns as you get uh, more units and you can get better returns as you get into cheaper properties. Um, and like to buy a $100,000 fourplex, it doesn't exist here at least not in the cities. If you're buying one, you're buying it in a town that doesn't have a lot going on. <laughs> so it's, there's not much, you're way out there anyway. Um, and my last point uh, for the differences was to hedge against the Canadian dollar. Um, no one really talks about that, but there's fluctuations in the dollar, right? And sometimes our dollar is uh, very strong and we're like very close to even. And what was it, at start of COVID, it went to like 1.45. So it's costing me like to buy a hundred bucks, it's costing me $145. Like that is expensive money, right? Um, as the difference, but it's coming down now. I think we're at 1.35 now, but it's one of those things you're like, Hey, I want to travel and the U S currency is more world traveled, right? Um, if you go into certain countries, they like the Canadian dollar, but for a whole, the American dollar is more accepted around the world. And it's, just, it's a good hedge to be getting paid in money that is more expensive. So every time I want to bring money back into Canada, I get this nice little chunk of extra. That's just an exchange rate, right? It kind of sucks at the start, or at least it feels like it when you're buying these properties. But I always tell people like you're getting paid back in those properties and I do quick. I'm usually quick with my money. So when I'm uh, joint venturing with people, I'm always looking to have quick turnarounds. Like even if we're buying like say a fourplex, I'm basically right now we're looking at some larger ones, but mostly it's four and under is what I'm usually doing. So I can get conventional. Um, and we're looking for like a whole renovation done in like four months or so, get it all tenanted. And at the six month mark, when the lenders are actually open to it is to do the refinance at that point. Um, I know as you wait longer with it, you get, get to a year, you can get a better, better rates, better loan to value but then your money's tied up for longer. And you know who the best people to invest in your next deal are? 
the people that you gave their money back in six months, and they'll put it back in. And you can, you don't have to take on as many partners. You can recycle and it, it, you just keep using the same money over and over again. You're, you are leveraging the properties up, but at the same time, no one has any, any money in the deal anymore. Sure. So can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on that strategy? And then another question I have from before is how can people get comfortable? I mean, you're investing, not, uh, I get these questions all the time. How do you get comfortable investing out of state if you have no infrastructure? Um, how do you get comfortable investing out of your own country? Uh, and, and, and then if you kind of talk, talk about that six month capital return, I'm, I'm very curious to understand that more. Yeah, so let me I'll start with the, the, the distance investing. Um, off the start, uh, what I did, which is not the way to do it, which is not the way I would recommend anyway, um, is I did uh, turnkey, right? And it made me a little comfortable just because everything was set up. Like they had loans that would work for Canadians. They had um, property managers set up, the property was renovated. So there wasn't dealing with all those problems. Um, and then at the start, I used to be not comfortable. Like I went down, I drove to Alabama and I saw the bricks. I walked through the house. Um, I don't do that anymore, but, and I don't buy turnkey anymore. Um, but it was a way to get comfortable off the start, but it's the expensive way to get comfortable because all those things are built into the cost, right? Like you're not just getting a whole package for free. They've set this up to make money. Um, so that's kind of how I, I, off the start, I, I went and saw it and I felt comfortable. And I think the biggest part was to get a good team. Um, my property managers were phenomenal. I, well, my second property managers in Alabama were phenomenal. I had to fire the first ones. Uh, and the second one, it worked out really good. And I think the key was communication. Um, they were really good at, especially maybe they, cause they knew I was new down there. Um, but they were, they constantly be on email or texts. And I had the, that property manager, which isn't typical, but I had their cell phone. So I was, we were texting back and forth and they were letting me know about the littlest things that were going on. If they were a day late, I knew, whereas most of my property managers don't, I don't even know they're late until I get the statement <laughs> um, now. But uh, th it was, it was very good communication, which helped me go to the next step was to start renovating properties. Um, and at the start, I was the, the most comfortable way to do it was to use your property manager. It's not the cheapest way, um, but they do have construction crews. They will do light renovations. Like a lot of times they're uh, and they will manage renovations for you. So I think the main part was to get that one key member. Like that was my, my cornerstone piece was a good, good property manager. And then once you had that, you could move on to getting the rest of the pieces. But that one was the biggest piece because they were connected to other pieces. Like if I needed a contractor, I needed an electrician, they had connections that could connect me. Um, and like I said, not necessarily the cheapest way. You could shop around, but sometimes depending on the property manager, and it changes because I wouldn't say the same thing in all the states I'm at, but if you have a really good trust like that, you can... <laughs> You, you, can, you can do so much stuff with it because you can sleep at night and if they're always on budget and on time, it doesn't matter if they're more expensive because the ones that aren't on budget and aren't on time, it doesn't matter because you can't sleep, you're stressed about it, <laughs> and it, you're, it, it consumes your life um, with people who are going way over time especially. And so that, that's what happened with a lot of people. When I started doing joint ventures, I'd be like, they're like, you never shopped around for contractors. I'm like, oh, in that state, that's the only one I use because they always get it on time and budget. And if I can pencil the numbers and those numbers work, then why, why would I go anywhere else? Because <laughs> it'll, it'll get done the way I want. Even if they've, I don't know if they're taking me to the cleaners or not, but it doesn't matter because I've made those numbers work. And so that's how I got comfortable. It's mostly one good piece then you could get really comfortable with. And if you're going to find that piece, I think the best way to do it is to find someone else who's already in that market. Um, ideally, I always say now is to partner with somebody um, and do the deal with them and you'll learn who they're using. You'll see receipts. Um, that's kind of how I started with the turnkey. I'd ask for receipts from, oh, they said, oh, we just did some electrical. Can I get a receipt for that? And I have the contract, the, the electrical contractor, because it's not an in-house person. So it's somebody I could use. Um, 
sometimes if it's an in-house person, like they had someone, a handyman, you're probably never going to get to use them. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it went. Um, and then for my uh, six month turnaround, the, what we we're usually trying to do is create some value in the house. Um, so we do this on the one to four units. And what we try to do is we buy something. Sometimes they're really distressed. We bought a, an $8,000 duplex in Dayton that didn't even have like, it, it was everything had to be done. But that, that one's a longer renovation. But a lot of times we're looking for something that we could do renovate in about three months. Um, and the contractors that I've used are, they have large teams. Um, sometimes they have, you know, multiple people in there working at the same time, like the, depending on which team we're talking about, some of them bring in like 10 guys and they're just all working at the same time. And some of them are just a couple guys, but you just have to factor that in your numbers, especially if you're doing carrying costs um, with uh, doing financing and other things. But I've actually almost completely turned away from doing the fix and flip loans. Uh, I've switched to doing uh, just finding people with cash because it's, it's low. They're under a hundred thousand properties we're looking for. So it's, it's easier to find cash money to do those sort of things. Um, so uh, what we do is we go in, we renovate the property. Um, usually, ideally, we're trying to add something. Um, one we're doing now, we're uh, opening the attic up, creating a loft. Uh, sometimes we like to add a bedroom. Sometimes we add a bathroom. Uh, we like to take uh, garages and convert them into a suite, like a master. So sometimes you can get a depending on the size of them, you can add a, a bathroom and a sink. Sometimes you can add a bathroom sink and a shower and, and a bedroom, right? And then uh, the, the tricky part is getting all the uh, heat and stuff run over there. Um, sometimes we cheap out and we just put baseboard in the garage. Sometimes we fully run the HVAC into the garage. Uh, that's much more expensive <laughs> than just running a, a line for some uh, baseboard. Um, but yeah, we, we create some value. Uh, then we go back to the table um, oh, so we, sometimes we rezone too. Uh, we've done that, we're especially uh, for buying foreclosures. We like to buy foreclosures that have problems with them, uh, like the zoning is messed up or the property lines are messed up and it'll go like right through the house or through the garage. And so we have uh, we had an attorney that would uh, basically do most of the work for us to sort those sort of things out. But once we got that all fixed, and those are the ones you can get really big discounts on because no one will buy them. They, everyone walks away from them. And you can be like, I think they wanted, the last one was they wanted 80,000 for it and we offered 50 and they said, no, that's crazy. But they had offers all around 80, 80, 80. And it was worth like a hundred, hundred thousand dollars as is. And they had lots of offers, but no, no one could close because no one would lend on a property that had a line right through the middle of it. But <laughs> so we said 50, we got to fix these problems, 50. We solved the whole thing for 10 grand. We paid off the neighbors, bought some land, got survey done, got an attorney to draw it all up, piece of cake. Um, so create some value, go back to the um, a lender, or like usually we're buying in cash now, but a lot of times we had fix and flip loans before, and then refinance. Pay back the JV or the, hard, or the money partner, whichever way you've done it, and do another one. It does cut down your cash flow a bit by refinancing and leveraging it up. Uh, but still as a Canadian, a lot of the times I'm getting 65% loan to value. So there's still a lot of, there's still, a, it's not like it's completely maxed out. Like the market really has to fall apart for us to be upside down even after the refi. Sure. And you're creating a lot of value quickly. So you're really yeah. um, pulling out your equity for most of it. And then yeah. the next project and doing it all over again. And um, you like to say, you know, if you, holding it more long-term, let's say five years plus, your equity value is still going to be the same. It's not going to go down. If only yeah. it's going to appreciate. So that's a really interesting strategy. And uh, we, we use the same strategy as well to a certain extent. Um, yeah. So Wait. that's, yeah, go ahead, Glenn. Go ahead. I, I lost my train of thought anyway. <laughs> oh, okay. No problem. I said, no, that's, that's really interesting, really interesting stuff. Um, so we're going to be winding on the show a little bit here. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of advice would you say for people just starting out that, um, you know, are in a, in a different country and different province to, you know, start looking in alternatives where they saw the same thing you did, their prices are just way too high and they weren't meeting your, you know, investment criteria. 
Where, where do they start? I think the educate yourself first. Um, you need to like, you can pay for these coaching programs. Um, if you're going to do that, actually like evaluate these coaching programs. Cause now it seems like everybody is starting a coaching program. So there's different levels of the quality of them, but, or even listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, what I, I used to have a job where I drove around all day long and I used to listen to about four hours of podcast every day. And in four hours, you can get through a lot of podcasts. Um, and the other thing is, if you're really new, uh, you don't have any money, you don't have, like, you don't have the education yet either, maybe you just want to volunteer to follow somebody around. Um, do some really easy tasks, run some numbers for them. You'll learn how to run the numbers. And it's like, it's just as valuable as paying for this education. Uh, I think hands-on, at least that's the way I learn, you learn so much more. Um, often when I'm reading books or listening to podcasts, I save them if they're good because to really absorb them, you're going to have to listen to them a couple of times. So for me, sometimes going to a coaching program or like a, a seminar, you're going to have to write notes or something because if you only can retain so much. So a lot of times you're just getting blasted with information. Um, so you need to have something that you can relook at. But yeah, get some, get some education somehow. And I would say volunteer. Uh, and, and if you have the money, partnering is easy. People will like line up to partner with you. Find who you think uh, is doing what you want to do and partner with them. Um, I'm not a syndicator. I thought I wanted to be a syndicator. And I, I, that's what I did off the start. I was like, I want to become a syndicator. And I'm like, who's what's, like, there's a lot of big names, but actually maybe I won't drop names on the show. But anyway, one of the biggest syndicators, one of the big ones down in the States, I went and gave him money and I wanted to be, I wanted to get copies of a private placement memorandum. I wanted to go through all the meetings. I wanted to learn the whole thing so that I could replicate it. I wanted to get connections to the attorneys that you know, came on the calls to talk. I wanted to learn the whole thing. And if you have the money to invest, that's one way to learn. Um, the other way is just to go find a syndication attorney and, and hire them. <laughs> um, but that's, it's, that's, that's expensive too, especially if you don't know what you're doing and you might have trouble raising money off the start. Um, for me, the way my business grew the fastest was doing the podcast. Like the, the podcast, it, exposes you to a lot of people. The hard part is now that there's like 10 billion podcasts on real estate. Um, and it's hard to stand out. It's hard to stand out because there's so many of them. Uh, and so that, that's the one thing I niched right down. So my listenership won't be as high as some of those big guys because I'm focused on people who are Canadians investing in the U S but it's niched, right? The people who are listening are, do we want, they're in the exact same mindset. They're interested in being Canadians investing in the U S and distance real, uh, real estate investors. So by niching down, I've got my list built and the people who listen to me are very focused on the same, same journey. <laughs> that is awesome. I had Mike on mute for a second. I heard I saw that. <laughs> um, no, that, that is awesome. Uh, so how can people find you, Glenn? Obviously your podcast and, and yeah. So my podcast, if you want to see me talk on it, it is on YouTube. Uh, but the main spots are the iTunes podcast, Google, Google play, uh, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify. Um, and also you can email me Glenn at Glenn .com. I do have a website. There's not a whole lot on it. That's educational. You get most of that from listening to the show. Email me if you have questions. A lot of the times I will just direct you initially to uh, certain podcasts. If you have a lot of questions about corporate structure, I'll say check out these episodes and then come back to me and we'll talk. And I'm an open book to sit down and do a Zoom with you and share. And But I usually I want you to do a little bit of preliminary work before I uh, we sit down because otherwise we're wasting both of our time. <laughs> sure. Oh, same thing here. So that was great. We really appreciate you coming on, Glenn. And what we'll do uh, for our show and our listeners, we're going to put a link to your podcast in the comment section of all the social media platforms and also in the iTunes description. So we'll have a link to, um, you know, your website, your social media and your podcast as well. So people have no excuse not to reach out to you. Um, Glenn, really appreciate you coming on the show here. You're the first uh, 
Canadian investor in the United States I've had on the show. So, uh, you know, welcome aboard. <laughs> and um, so hopefully, hopefully we'll have you on again uh, within the next six months or so and see what you're up to then at that sure. time. That sounds great. Thanks for having me. I think I really appreciate it. Thank you, Glenn.